There she is. All right, let's get started. Today is the day that we dive back into everyone's favorite-ish topic, functions, round number two. As always, before we do that, we have even something more fun, and that's called announcements. And I think everyone knows the first one. Assignment number one. The first assignment is due. Remember, it was due at 5.30. If it was not turned in and you have not told Clark or your TA about it, reach out to them ASAP. Make sure that was in there because it is due at 5.30. Again, if it is late, reach out to Clark. I cannot do anything about it. Talk to Clark, talk to your TAs. They'll get you appointed. Just, yeah, they will do whatever they need to do. The second thing is, as always, we'll have a lecture review or excuse me, studio review at 8 p.m. tonight. Feel free to join in on that. As always, it will be recorded. You don't have to join. Feel free to join whatever you are done with your small groups. And then finally, just a quick little thing. I'm going to be reminding you all next week about this as well. But um, I am going to actually be off the grid here, literally off the grid, uh, 128 to 2 slash 1. That is just a one quick weekend there. Um, we will actually be having a guest lecturer on Monday. Bree will be stepping in. More about that on Thursday. Just want to let you all know right now. All right. Y'all ready for this? Grab that popcorn, grab that coffee, grab extra coffee if it's one of those Mondays, because we got a lot of stuff to learn here today. Or one of those like energy drinks that I'm, I'm out of, I'm at, like, it's like I'm not even on the TikTok and I don't even know all the energy drinks anymore. All I know is Red Bull, but grab all those, whatever you need to do. Any final questions before we start diving into the cool stuff? I have one quick question. So that yeah. that uh, assignment was basically like the way that they're like tying in everything we've learned so far into like one thing? Exactly. And that will be how all assignments are. As we learn upon each and everything about programming, whether it be the function stuff we learned tonight or whatever is to come, our assignments will always be utilizing all of that. So we'll see that in assignment two. So well, my, my, like, yeah. my, my part two of that question was, is one thing that like, so like I'm pretty confident about for loops, but I don't think I've done a single while loop since the time that we talked about it. Is that something that's not very common? While loops are more common. However, the use cases can get, are very uh, much more specific. So you'll see okay. while loops and when they're used into the future, but a little, as long as you still know about them, the concept okay. of looping is what they really wanted to go over and also erase. So what does a gotcha. loop actually do? How does the computer think? But it's good that you called it out. While loops will be there. Okay. Yeah, eventually. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And also, don't forget about any of the past information that we learned either, because we'll just be building upon that. Well, any other questions? All right, in that case, let's get started. If I can find my mouse and everything else, there we go. I can already tell it's gonna be one of those days with this computer. All right, let's do this. And Henry, I really like your question too, is that about assignment one, and the one little spiel I always wanna talk about is that you just completed assignment one. If you're sitting here in this lecture and you're happy, you most likely comp completed assignment one. Are you happy about how assignment one treated you? Maybe not, but still you got it across that line. So congratulate, <laughs> congratulate yourself up for that. What a big takeaway we have from assignment one is that we now know all the essential building blocks of creating an application. And in general, though you just know JavaScript as a language, these are the building blocks that we utilize for any language out there in the programming world. Of course, we're just focused on JavaScript right now, but the big thing to know is that we have all the pieces of the puzzle to build any kind of application we want out there. Now, are there better practices and things that can make our lives easier? Absolutely. But the thing to take away from this is that we have what we need. Those building blocks that we're talking about specifically, the first thing you talked about was variables. You know variables. They're the things that actually help computers retain and remember information so we can use it down the line on our applications. The second thing we learned after that was how to ask a question. Our computer how to ask a question. How do we validate something? How do we check if something is something else? Hence the if statements. If something is true, we want to do something. In some cases, if something is false, we want to do something. We are able to now make decisions in our code. That is what if statements are for. Continuing on, and one thing I already heard that someone doesn't like. After that, we're able to then repeat 
information, repeat code in our applications. We're able to, instead of writing huge lines of code, we're able to loop over stuff. Hence, cutting down on how much stuff we actually need and be allowing, allowing us to manipulate information in certain ways, such as arrays inside of those for loops. We're able to loop over things while conditionals are true. So this is allowing us then to make repetitive code, which as you know, computers love repetitive tasks. For loops are perfect for that. And then finally, the other F word we do not like to talk about, but unfortunately we do, functions. Now we're able to create individual tasks to allow our applications to do individual things as many times as we want. As you know, functions are reusable. With these four building blocks, we are able to create any kind of set of application we truly want. Now, will it be a pain in the butt sometimes because we want to do something complicated? Absolutely, but we still have that know-how. Now, help me out with this. Knowing all of these parts of the application, what particularly is this one? Just make sure we all remember this. Yep, Very yell it at me. Very good, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna call this one a variable. Absolutely right. But if we wanted to iterate through an array, what building block would we use for that one? Loops. Or loop. Very good. Or loop. If we ever want to manipulate the array or anything like that, yes, we want to use those for loops. Just remember that we do not want to manipulate the array that is being looped over. But you're absolutely right, a for loop for this one. What if we wanted to create a reusable task? Functions. Very good. Functions. That's how we can individualize this code that we've created to run tasks when and where we want to in our code. Absolutely right. Functions. And then if we wanted to validate if two variables were equal, what tool would we use here? If statement. Very good. We want to use an if statement, which you are close. A Boolean is a data type that we need to use inside of if statements, aka for those conditionals. But the tool that we're going to be looking for is the if statement. Awesome. Now, if we look at this thing, what is it called? A function. Oh. Very good. And how, is, how do we know it's a function? What gives it away? It has parentheses. Empty parentheses. Exactly, it has parentheses. Open empty parentheses. parentheses. It has that mouth right there. Mouth that we can feed parameters inside of it. Yes, absolutely. Those parentheses are truly making this a function. Really calling it out there. So yes, absolutely, that is a function. All right, how about this one? That's a method. method. Yeah. Good. Particularly this portion. Call it a method or a function, either one you want to do, but yes, it is a function. Absolutely right. So yes, that is what we are referring to as those functions again, because it has those parentheses. Just because it has a dot operator on there, it's just one of those helper functions on a data object. In this case, my array would be just an array. Awesome, awesome. All right, so looking at this again, just remember these are those building blocks. If I ever refer to one of these as which tool should you use, these are the tools I'm referring to. Should you use a variable, an if statement, loop, or a function? It's along those lines. So just remember these are the tools right now that you have in your toolbox to create those applications out there to finish your exercises and finish your studios. Awesome, awesome. Let's keep going. We're going to bring in that fun thing. We're going to go ahead and build a function here. So help me out here. How would we create a function called add two numbers that takes in no parameters? Function. Oh, exactly. We start with the keyword add function. Two. Start with the keyword function. Very good. Then what comes next? Add two add numbers. numbers. Very good. The name of the function. In this case, the instructions say add two numbers. So we call the function add two numbers. Parentheses. Awesome. And then Very good. I didn't have to say anything. You're like, I know what's next. Yes, the parentheses. We always need to make sure that when we're creating the function, we place those parentheses there and then the curly brackets to actually contain the code. In this case, we said we want it to add two numbers and it takes no parameters. So I'm going to help us out here. I'm going to add a variable called answer and it adds one plus two here. My question to you is then, how do we give back that answer from this function. Return. 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 Answer. Return. Very good. No, I heard it. We use the keyword, the very powerful keyword return, and then what we want to return, answer. <clears throat> now, how many things can we return from a function? Only one. Very good. Zero to one things we can return from a function. We need to return nothing or one thing. That is it. Very good. All right, 
Let's bring in this. How will we edit this function and take in two parameters? Possibly num1 and num2. Parenthesis, num1, num2. Very good. Absolutely. I heard it all right there. So we're going to put it together. So taking those two parameters, we start with the parentheses. We say num1, comma, to separate it, num2, close those parentheses, curly brackets. And there we go. The magic just happened. Now we can utilize those parameters inside of this function. To do that, we just use it right there. We say let answer now equal num1 and num2. <laughs> So now we're able to use the parameters that are passed into this function and actually allow the user, whoever the coder is, or even the programmer or the computer or whatever, to add two numbers inside of our function. Crazy stuff. But then what do we need to do again after we add these numbers together? Return. Well, this function okay. return. Very good. Okay. Exactly. We need to return our answer. Ask yourself, will your function even be useful to this person if it doesn't return something? We're just adding two numbers and never tell anybody the answer. Does that help anybody? No, we need to return the answer. Very good. Awesome job, everyone. Yes, this is functions. Fun, fun functions. You said you didn't like functions. Look at you all. You just created a bunch of them. How do you not like them? You're perfect at them. Come on. You guys just want to complain about functions. They're not going to go away. All right. Let's keep exploring more about functions here. So, with this, what I'm going to bring in is just another variable with fave movie as Ghostbusters. No, I'm not using dogs today. I'm just taking a quick break. I know everyone's like, I'm feel, I feel like everyone's going to get an allergy from dogs for how many times I use them examples. Taking a second off, all good. So we know that this variable here, fave movie Ghostbusters, is a string. Awesome. Nothing different about that. We're going to bring in a few other things in here. So an IMDB rating, which honestly I just figured out what that was two years ago. Yes, I know it's embarrassing. In this case, it's going to be a 7.8. Remember, even if a decimal, Decimal is, I, excuse me, even though a decimal is a decimal, it is still technically a number in JavaScript's eye. So in this case, the data type is still a number here. And then we're going to bring in one more fun thing. We're going to bring in the cast here with Bill, Dan, and oh, every time I use this presentation, I always forget how to actually pronounce his name. And I have you all on mute. So when you are unmuted, yell his name at me because I always forget the correct pronunciation. I am absolutely horrid at names. Anywho, this is the cast, but it's a cast array. It's an array of strings. If there are cast members here. So we have all this information. Let's go ahead. And what we are going to do here is that we're just going to split our favorite movie. This fave movie dot split here. So what this is going to do, as we talked about before, is that it is going to do what to our favorite movie? I'm going to go ahead and unmute you all. Yell it at me. How does this split do to our favorite movie? It splits up each item and puts them in an array. Very good. Yes, it is going to split up this favorite movie into individual characters. Awesome. So it's going to split it up into there. All good. If we do a dot split on IMDb rating, what's going to happen? The number and the period and and oh, seven, maybe. seven period eight will all be in array. Split a number? No. Technically, seven it is not. Eight. Technically, it's not a string. So strings are the only ones that can do oh. a dot split on them or arrays. So the number yeah. actually would not work. So on DB rating would actually give you an error. However, Oops, we could use it on the cast dot split. No, excuse me. We cannot use it on the cast dot split because that is an array. The only one the split method works on is actually the string. So in this case, it will give you an error. I apologize, I had a little brain fart there. So this function that we just talked about, the split function, can only be used on a specific data type. So I really want to call that out, that data types, we talked about this a little bit in previous lectures, that data types like string, number, and arrays have specific helper functions. For strings, split is one of them. So just remember that split is one of our helper methods. Another one that you've seen right there is also, I don't know why I have slice on there, but um, yes, slice technically. I don't think slice is correct. Right. We can specify what character we want to use to split by, right? Like If you're we're talking like about specifically limiting? about the split method, absolutely. You don't have to put empty quotes in there. You can say, I want to split by um, the T of ghost. In that case, it's going to give you two arrays, one with a thing, G host and then usters on the right-hand side. So you can tell exactly what character to slice it on if you want to do that. Can we, uh, can we delimit on a space? 
absolutely. If you want to split it by spaces, for, for sure. Okay. So if you have a sentence that you want to split into words, you'd split it by spaces. Mm. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Great question there. So to continue on, what we're talking about here is now a number. So I bring an IMDB rating that two fixed here, and I say zero. What this is going to do is actually it's going to round it up for me to an eight. So essentially, two fix is just another helper method on numbers. Now, for these particular ones, you don't have to copy them down. I just want to give you a quick example. So I'm DB rating two fixed is zero. It gives us eight. If we try to do that on fave movie or on, we try to do that on cast, we'll get an error there too, because two fixed is specific to the number data type. So again, remember, data types have specific helper methods. That was what we're going through right now. So for there, we have numbers for the two fixed. Now, one more I want to talk to you about is the cast.sort. This will sort it, our Dan, or sorry, Bill, Dan, and is it Sergey? It's Sigourney. 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 Thank you. Bill, Dan, and Sigourney here from A to Z. A Sigourney is a she. Is it a yes. she? Okay. Yes. See, this so is I do not. Kyle? I'm bad. I'm bad. Yeah. I am not good at names. I told you I booked them. I don't know. <laughs> don't use that tone with me. Like, Kyle, how dare you? He's like, I know. I let you down. I wasn't going to call you I'm out. Sorry. They're going to shake it. like, wow, logging off. I'll catch the lecture later. <laughs> yes. So, Gordy Weaver, I apologize. Now the name is going through the head. That's why I'm drinking the coffee right now. Yes, yeah, Sigourney Weaver. Okay, anyway, cast.sort will essentially, excuse me, will alphabetize our array up here exactly to what it is now. So it doesn't really give us a great example here, but it will still be Bill, Dan, and Sigourney. So this will map it from A to Z. Now, where am I going with all this? These have been all great helper methods for these data types. But today I want to introduce you to a different one, a very powerful helper method that only exists on arrays. That one that I want to talk to you about is called a map, cast.map. What this thing does is that it builds or rebuilds an array to your specifications. We can now do things to an array inside of this helper method somehow to help recreate an array to our liking. So that's what we're going to be learning how to do today. So this, what is very specific about it and why we can't get too much into detail is that it really takes in a new kind of data type we haven't really talked about yet. Rena, thank you very much for that. I was thinking about, I was like, well, I would have put slice in there if it works. So let's go with both string and array. Yeah, so some there is sometimes of uh, crossovers between the two data types. Sometimes, like as we just saw here, slice exists on string, but slice will also exist on array. So great call out there. Thank you. I was going to double check myself for that one. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. So yes, mapping, or as all the helper methods we just saw, from split, slice, to fixed, all the way down here to mapping, everyone usually will take in a different data type into the parameters if they need it. This map takes in a different kind of data type that we need to talk about today. So let's go in and see what that is exactly now. If I can get my mouse back. I'm on computer. Thank you. So we bring in that dot map. And what we want to do is that we need to insert something into this map. Remember, map rebuilds an array to how we want to see it. So we need to rebuild this array and tell this map how to do it. How to do it, essentially, we need to give the map a task to complete every single time it's trying to rebuild the array. If we're trying to give it a task, essentially, what are our tasks in programming? They are types of functions. So in this map, what we're trying to do is provide it the instructions to create or recreate our array. So what we just did here, or what we're going to be doing, is passing in a function to recreate our array for us. So everyone's probably asking right now, is like, what in the heck is that thing we just passed in to that map? And you said it was a data type. What in the heck are you doing to us, Kyle? Well, let, again, as always, the whole functions lecture, let me explain a little bit more in depth. Let's go ahead and talk about what we just saw here in our map. So for this, what we just placed in here was a kind of data. The data type is a function. 
we're trying to pass in an actual function into this mapping. That's what we see here. We dictate it with the name function. But look at it very, very closely. This function that we're actually working with has absolutely no name. <laughs> this function that we're passing into the mapping has no name. We use the keyword function, but we didn't give it any kind of name. It's almost like it has no name. It's almost like it's anonymous, AKA an anonymous function. It has no name truly associated with it. Hence, this, what we are inter being introduced to right now against our will is called an anonymous function. It's one that can be placed inside of other functions like this, like map, to do a specific task and then be forgotten about. So again, this name is called an anonymous function. So this is a quick introduction of a map. So let's go ahead and we are going to deep dive a little bit more into anonymous functions. But real quick, I'm going to pause here and just yell it at me any questions you have. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into it, but I wanna just settle any other small things that we just saw here. Um, any, any discrepancies out there that we wanna go over real quick? Any questions at all? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, what's going on? So, Okay, when you did the cast map function item, where it's, what item are we entering there? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and go through that. Just want to solve up any questions. I promise, Jasmine, it will get a little bit easier, hopefully, here. We'll go ahead and talk about what exactly all this means in just a moment. I just want to see if there's any questions out there, too, while I'm just grabbing some other info also. Oh, so okay. Give me one second, and we will sure. deep dive a little bit more into that. I apologize. For I didn't sure. have, I needed to get one more. I need to open up a repli here just for a second here. So take a breath, take a deep breath. We're about to get even more deep into anonymous functions, but just gotta hold, open this up. Uh, there we go. That's one thing I forgot to open today. Computer's just being so dang slow. It is Monday, so I'll give it a break. Kyle. <laughs> What's Hello? going on? Hey, how you doing? So this is too. I'm sorry I missed uh, uh, part of the lecture. Like traffic was like serial killer, murder-like. So, but look, excuse me. Uh, what's the purpose of defining and using something if it's only passed, if it can't be passed nowhere else in the program? Or prove it to, uh, help me understand. And I, I did miss the beginning of the lecture. Absolutely. So think of it as something, and I'm gonna just go ahead and drag something down here real quick, just so I have it there for my purposes. Stuff. So um, think of it as you know, a decent thing, what we would want to use. Essentially, an anonymous function is something that you're only going to want to use once or twice. Anonymous functions are something that you don't want around very long. Named functions are something that you're going to use all the time. Something that you want to keep coming around all the time. We're going to see more on this, but I'll answer your question right now. Anonymous functions are something that I want you to do this quick thing, and that's all I want you to do. I never need you again. Name functions are something that sticks around, like, I like you. Stick with me. We're going to be using you quite a bit. So that's the kind of the difference there. And we'll see that as we move a little bit further. But in essence, anonymous functions are just there for one-time things. I just want to create this array in a certain way only one time in my application. I'll use a quick anonymous function, and then I'll forget about it. But we saw other name functions like ask user for input. I'm gonna be asking the user input for a lot of things. So I wanna create that as a name function so it sticks around. So that's kind of the difference there. Does that help I, out? I don't know actually, I never got your full name, but I see JJ83 on your zoo. I just wanna make sure that helps you out. JJ is just fine. JJ, all right, JJ, awesome. All right. I have a quick cool question. Yeah, what's going on? So I was confused about anonymous functions and the reading, like yeah. so confused. How does it know what to do if, it, if the function isn't like, it's not named? How does it know what it's supposed to do? So just because names are for to refer to something. So just because the name of the function is so it can refer to it over and over. So it can call it whenever it wants. Anonymous function, it doesn't have a name. It's just there for a moment and then gone because they don't have a name. 
So you forget about the person as soon as they walk out of the room. Think of it as somebody who just comes in an office, gives you some copies, and then goes out of the office. They gave you, did a task for you, but you never asked for their name because you only need the papers once ever in your life. So anonymous functions, how they know not to call them is because they're calling them right now and will forget about them right after. Hence, they don't need a name. They're there for a moment to give you a pack of papers and then walk out of the room, never to be seen again. Walks into the mist, whatever you want to say. But that's essentially what anonymous functions are for. Does that kind of help out, Annie? Yeah, I think I sometimes confuse functions with like array stuff, like filter and pop and find. So I think that's why I was confused. So yes, that clears everything up actually. Good, good. All right. Well, you know what, to help us all out here and just to see something, let's go ahead and see it in action actually. That's more fun anyway. Let's go ahead and take this mapping right here. Let me just make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. We're gonna go ahead and just go ahead and put this in REPLIT real quick. So what we're gonna do is come over here and we're gonna bring in those variables. Like we said, we have our fave movie. So I'm gonna say const fave movie because it's never gonna change. I always love Ghostbusters. Fave movie as Ghostbusters here. And then we're just gonna skip over the IMDB rating just for a moment and we're gonna say const cast here. And we have Bill in there. Come on. Sorry, everybody. My computer is just not wanting to be helpful today. There we go. And this computer is going to have a long talk after this lecture. Bill, Dan, probably going to complain. It's like, you haven't turned me off in ages. I'm like, nah, we're fine. All right. And then Sigori, which I'm totally not looking on the other screen to spell this right now. I think I got it right. There we go. All right, so let's go ahead and create that function. So what was the function that we're using? What's the helper function that we're using on this array called? What's the new one we learned today? Map. Very good map. Dot map. So say cast.map here. Awesome, and so what is the data type that map asks for? The star, the item, I don't know. Function. The data type function. particular that we're looking, what was it? Function. 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 It's looking for the data function. type of function. It An wants anonymous a function. function. It can actually have a name function or anonymous function in its mouth. It depends, but they're both functions. But you're right. In this case, we're going to be doing anonymous function. So I'll go with this one. So to create an anonymous function, what keyword do I start with? Function. Very good. Function. Now, what name do I give an anonymous function? No name. No name. Exactly. Trick question. You totally got that. Awesome job. Yes, no name for anonymous mm -hmm. functions. They are saying anonymous. They don't want you to know their name. It almost seems like they're up to something, but they're not. They're here to help. So no, we just put parentheses there. We say function parentheses. And then one thing we haven't really talked about, which we will hear soon, I put this name item inside of those parentheses. And then I place yeah. these curly brackets here. So right there, we just created an anonymous function. Now, the thing we haven't talked about yet is that the map asks for these anonymous functions to do a very specific thing. It wants you to take a piece of the array, do something with it, and then give it back what it should be. What do I mean by that? A piece of the array. I mean Bill here is a piece of the array, one of the indexes of the array. And Dan, and Sigourney, Sigourney, excuse me. So we need to do something with each part of this array and then return it back. Now, real quick, before we even run anything in here, what I want to do is console log what we see inside of the cast array. So we just say console log, because that's how we see something with just human eyes over there in the console. And we say cast, just like that. We're going to go and run this and just see what happens. We see Bill, Dan, and Sabrina. Awesome. That's all we need to see there. Now let's actually start getting into this anonymous function. Do you all want to see what item is? Let's go ahead and see what this actually is. We're going to console log it because we can do that. Now I'm going to go ahead and run this. We're still going to see the array at the very top be printed out, but now we get to see each and individual item printed out on its own line. The item, this weird little parameter we have here that just came out of nowhere is actually each individual item inside of the array. Bill, Dan, and Sigourney. So in that case, 
when we're console logging it, that's what we're seeing. So these items that we were asked about are actually each part of the array. So again, map wants you to take this item and do something to it and then rebuild the array with it. So in this case, for the example we just saw, what we want to do is return the new thing we created from this item. In that case, I'm going to say the star colon quotes plus item. So now what I'm doing is that I'm saying take in the item, but give it this extra string on the left-hand side, and then return that back and create my array that way. So what I'm going to say is const new cast equals whatever's returned from this map function. So what I did is I mapped it, aka I recreated the array, and then it comes back, it's returned, and it creates a new array, and it's saved in this new cast. So that's just what happened here. And then one last thing before we start undoing all those headaches I'm causing out there. I'm going to go ahead and just console log new cast just to see what this is in the end. So I'm going to run this. So now we have two arrays. The first one, again, is coming from this line number five, this console log. So don't even worry about it. It's just our original array. It's our original array there. Then 11, we print out the new array. Now we see in this array, we have recreated those items to say the star colon Bill, the, the star colon Dan, et cetera. So we've recreated this array to do something. So that's what this mapping function does. It's just taking in an array, saying, how do you want me to configure it? And then spits out a new one for you. But to do all of that, to do just that simple task, if you want to call it simple, we have to use that new thing we just learned about, which is an anonymous function. That anonymous function being exactly what you see here. It's really just a function without a name. Hence the name anonymous function. So from this, who's got a question? Can we use a name to function here? Can you use a name function? Let's go ahead and see how you do that with the map. So in here, you, you could use a name function. However, you couldn't name this function my function or something like that. You can't, you typically do not want to create a function inside of this thing. You don't want to do that. You'll only create an anonymous function with those in those parentheses. You won't create a name function within them. I don't even know what would happen if I ran this. Yeah, technically the same thing. Do not do this. Do not do this. That is dangerous stuff right there. What you do, just how we saw it last week, you create the function out here, and then you'd pass in my function. And then run it. So that's how you'd use it with a named function. So this is how you'd use it with a named function. Now, so does map only used in arrays? We do not use in strings or numbers? Say that one more time. The map we used only in arrays, not in strings or numbers, like constant favorite movie course, but we cannot use map in this one. Correct. Map will only be used for arrays. Okay. Yep. Does item always stand for like the stuff inside of the array? Yes, and you don't have to okay. use the name item. It can be anything, but yes, that will, okay. this parameter, whatever you name it, will always be the thing in the array. Got it. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Um, awesome. I have a quick question. Yeah, Ben. Is this like, could you say that this is sort of similar or could you like get a similar result if you had an array with those names and did like some type of like for loop? And then like every time it went through the array, you could like add like console log like this plus the name or something or like plus I. Is that similar or different? Am I right? Am I wrong? Like that's kind no, of- No, 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 you are similar. That is exactly what you could do if you want to do a for loop instead. But remember that you'd be technically manipulating or changing the exact same array that you're looping over. In this case, it creates you a brand new one instead. Gotcha. So it kind right. of saves you a few lines of code as well. Right, right. That. Okay. But yeah, Thank you're, you're on, if you, again, if you want to use those original building blocks, that's how you do it. So I love it. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, map can be used only for one item at a time? One item at a time. Yep, absolutely right. So you're only going to ever have one item in there at a time. Someone asked 
earlier, but um, I think I'm still confused about the use of item in the parameters for my function. Same, um, yes. Like, so this one right here? You, yeah, you said it would always qualify, whatever's wrapped in here would always qualify as the like items listed in an array, but what if there's multiple arrays up top? Then do we have to specify using the uh, brackets? Which well, so array we're trying to pull from? So if we are looking to do multiple arrays, so we'll say const dog names as always. There you go, dogs are back, get ready for those allergies. We're gonna say Stark in here, and then we'll just say uh, Bella. It's the second one. Okay. Now we have two arrays here, right? Mm -hmm. Down here, we dictated what exactly, which array we wanted to map over. So if I wanted to create a new one, saying const new dog cast, oh. what would I use right. is I'm calling out that specific array that I want to use. So in that case, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right, and I'm happy to show this too. So dog name dot map, but look at the fun thing here, because we're doing a name function, we'd say my function, which I'm happy you called it. First, I want to make sure, Andrew, does this help out? Yeah, it does. I, I, was, I was focused on the wrong thing. Totally. No, no, no all good. But I do want to show, this is a case that we would want to maybe, wouldn't want to maybe use an anonymous function but instead use a named function because I used it twice here. So this would be a case maybe, okay, I wanted both, both of my maps for both of them to do exactly this, exactly this. I have two cases I wanna do the exactly the same thing. That's maybe more of an indicator of a name function. But if I wanted this one to say the star is, oh, again, I gotta take out that name. We don't want that name in there, get out of there. And I want this one to say, the dog we're doing two different things here so we're mapping them in two different ways because they're oh, two arrays of different things this is when we use anonymous functions because we'll never use that task again can you use a uh, map on an array inside of an array so map inside of an array inside of an array yeah. So if I wanted to loop over the stars and every single time I want to loop over my dog array? Yeah. Say you built a function that just so happens to add numbers together, but you wanted to do a certain set of numbers inside an array of a list of numbers. Well, to answer your question, yes. Just make sure when you are looping over, if you're doing a double loop, make sure you know why it's looping over it twice and that's what you want. But yes, you are absolutely able. If I wanted to put a map inside of here, I can do that if I wanted to do that and I saw the case for it to happen. Okay, and so the map would be have to be inside, the cast.map would have to be inside the new map. The new map would have to be in the previous map inside the uh, function that you were asking. Exactly, so you could always map within a map, that's all fine, just like you can loop within a loop. Again, the biggest thing is make sure you know why you wanna do that before you do that. Because there, there, are, there are cases you can do it. It's just very rare that you'd want to. Okay, I was it, just it curious if you could. Yeah. No, 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 great. Explore the curiosity. All good with it. Yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, I have a question about the return um, yeah. keyword. So is there ever a time when you would return something outside of the curly brackets? So in this case, we wouldn't be able to put a return in here. So if we were saying return this, no, you'll typically always want to return inside of those curly brackets, always. Because that's okay. within the function itself. A okay. function has, a function sometimes will want to return something. If it does want to return something like it does now, it has to be within the curly brackets of the function itself. Okay. Good question. So I see that you, yeah. after the returns, you didn't call the function, or did you? Which function? Are we talking about the anonymous function or the mapping function? The anonymous, well, the map function, actually. So the map I see function console.log the new cast. Right. But I don't see where you called the function for like the dog name dot map, I don't see. So right here, dog name dot map. And then when we use these parentheses, it's indicating us calling to the function. Mm, Remember when we okay. use those parentheses, we're calling to that function. So that's where okay. we do it right here with highlighted. And then inside of those parentheses, we say the anonymous function we want it to run every time it goes over an item. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Great question right. there. Yes, yes. That is it. Um, uh, could yeah. you explain um, 
why when you put in my function, you didn't have to uh, specify the parameters that you wanted? Like, does it already automatically know that do you want to put the items from like cast in there? So we do, or so are we talking about the anonymous function for specifying the parameters? Or um, where it says like my function and then you have uh, items, does it already know what the items are? Like, does yes. it already know like, oh, I need to put Dill in there. I need to put Dan in there. I need to put Sigourney Weaver in there. Okay, so one, just to clarify too, we're not using my function anywhere, but this is a re clear representation of the anonymous function down here, except that my function clearly has a name. But to answer your question, yes, it knows that whatever you name this parameter as, which again, we can just name it cookie if we wanted to, it will put each individual item in there for you. It will say, okay, I see you want the first parameter, I'm always going to put Bill, then Dan, then Sir Gorney. So you can do that. Um, so it just basically knows off the top of its head, it's going to put it into those parameters for you. So Thank yes, you. that's maps. Yeah, absolutely. Maps gonna do that for you. All right, I'm going up here real quick, and then we gotta keep going. Just got a few more things we gotta go over today. Um, let's see. Can you use dot map to go over a multi-dimensional array? Bill, Dan, and Squinty. Uh, technically, you could. You'd have to. It'd be it would be fun, but you have to detect because you have strings in here. So Bill and Dan are a string, Jacob. And then Zagorny right there is an array. So you'd have to have a detector, an if statement in your map, possibly, to see when an array pops out of there as an item and then map over that one. So that's kind of a fun little task. But yes, you can always just do another map for a two dimensional array like that. But um, my question was like, still the array containing Bill, Dan, and um, that items. Uh, still, the the array name cast is pointing to the container, right? So when we're are you talking about when we're editing those items? Yes, yes. Still, so the name of the array you still cast. Or so when it's done changing all those items in that array, it's actually going to create this new one called new cast. So they're going to be two different arrays at the very end of it. One with our original contents, Bill, Dan, and Sigourney, and then the one that says the star colon, etc. So we're going to have two different arrays at the end of this, as we see here, with the cast.map here and the new cast, which catches everything from the mapping function. So two different arrays you. there. Absolutely, Anna. All right. I'm going to have to pause it there, guys, and we are going to keep on going. Kyle, or I'll get one more here. Last one. Kyle, is there a reason that we use item instead of I now? Remember, I is for the for loop. So I is for for loops to keep that numeric index, 0, 1, 2, et cetera. So you can use I here if that helps out. But you can name it, again, as we see here, we can name it to any arbitrary name we want. In this case, it can be cookie. It can be item. If you want to put it as I, that's fine. But index is why we use lowercase i in the for loop. And item, that starts with an i, they didn't technically correlate, but I can see where you come from. So you can use either one as long as you're comfortable with that. Does map change the original array? It does not. The original contents stays intact. All right. Brad, does that help you out? Possible? Take silence as a yes. If it doesn't, let me know. All yes. Right. Okay. Sorry, awesome, I was away awesome. from the mic. No, no, you're all good. All right, let's keep going here. So yes, we, as you know, this is an anonymous function. So let's keep diving into it just a little bit more. We're going over some things that hopefully we know, but we're going to just make sure we remember this. So this function, as you know now, this is an anonymous function. We know it's an anonymous function because it has no name in it. They're typically well used in those helper methods that we just saw, dot map. There's a few out there which we haven't talked about yet, but dot map is the one we need to focus on right now. So as we already talked about, these functions are created to do a task, but a task that only needs to really happen periodically or once. Very, very, very unique. So anonymous functions are passed as those parameters to do that task and then be forgotten about. As we talked about that small little analogy is someone coming into the office, giving you a pack of papers you've never seen in your life, and then getting out of there. You don't ask their name, but they still did a task. 
anonymous function. It's a very, very simple task. So going into that, what exactly are the differences? We've already talked about this a little bit. What is the difference between a name function and anonymous function? Well, there are quite a bit of differences in when to use them. So when we talk about anonymous functions, therefore, when you need to pass a function as an argument, if you're creating a function that does a lot of heavy lifting, aka does a lot of stuff, most likely that's an indicator that you should not be using an anonymous function. If you need to do something more lightweight, like pass it into a dot map, that's more of an indicator that you need to use an anonymous function. Something very simplistic to do something really quick and then whatever, pass it back, whatever that function needs you to, or whatever that helper function like map needs you to do. This is an anonymous function, it's something very lightweight and doesn't need to be used very often. Look at the other side. We're looking at the name functions. It's for the tasks at hand that are a little bit heavier or a bit heavier lifting. So this is the ones that we possibly want to do larger tasks like, I don't know, like, like we said, ask user for input. If you want to go get information from somewhere, compute a bunch of numbers, add two numbers together like we saw in the beginning of lecture. Those are functions that can be reused for different purposes. So if it can be reused for different purposes, then we want to name it so it stays around. We want to keep it as our buddy. So if you see a purpose for a function, that you're gonna use multiple times inside of your application, that is a huge indicator it should be a named function. So as we see both of these, or let me see what I wrote, for our tasks that we want our computer to run that will not be passed in as argument. Yes, exactly. So typically you don't wanna use name functions as a parameter all the time. However, you can if you see that, as we just saw in the past example, if something's very, very, um, if you're going to see using that code a lot, you're going to map a lot of things in the same way, you can do that. However, that's a, that's a very rare use case. You typically just want to use anonymous functions for that. But the big thing about this is that both still take in multiple parameters. And another big thing is that they're both still functions. They can only return one thing. They don't have to return something, but if they do, it can only be one thing. All right. Deep breaths. Deep breaths. It's okay. It's hey, okay. real quick. Um, yes, Andrew. Can can you refresh me? I'm I'm a little zoned out. Um, the brackets at the end of the name function. Why are those there on the name function, but not the anonymous one? Technically, they are. If we look over here, we write that anonymous function. They do have brackets. Oh, okay. It was just the the image you captured. Okay. It was just the image. Yeah. So okay. for this I was, one, I the, thought I missed something. <laughs> yes. Both both types of functions will always have those curly brackets. Thank you for right. calling that okay. out. Yes. Yes. Cool. Well, absolutely. The the parentheses are are always there uh, declaring it and most calls. But when you're passing, if it's a named function, a named function being passed as a parameter, you don't have to include the uh, you don't have to include those parentheses. Because because when you pass it as a parameter, it's you're not calling it directly. The map method is calling it, uh, but it's as a parameter. You're just passing that uh, function object as the parameter, and that's why you wouldn't. When you're passing a named function, you don't include the extra pair of parentheses. Yeah. Right? So if you're going at yeah, if you're going at it what? like my anonymous <laughs> function here right here is being a name of a a named function. Yes, you don't have to include the curly brackets. The only time we include those curly brackets is when we create the function. Remember, functions have two steps. You have to create them and call them. Right. Anonymous functions just happen to have both those steps at once. But yes, when you create the function, make sure you use those curly brackets. If you call it, you don't need to include the curly brackets. Very good call out there, Andrew. Oh, excuse me, Raiden. Raiden, yes, you did that. And then, Raiden, I also saw your uh, question about the garbage collector. I did not skip over that. It's the garbage collection for functions is going to be just like variables. As you go over, it's going to be forgotten about once it's outside of that scope slash context. So if you want to look at more of that, feel free to do it on the side. If you want to ask me after class about it, I'm all there. A garbage collection in me and JavaScript don't really collide too much. I know my C-sharp garbage collection cycles, but not too much with JavaScript. So I can try to answer your question. I might have to point you to the internet. Oh, that was long-winded there. Whew. All right. Any other questions here before uh, we dive Kyle, into some stuff? For yes, Sean. For functions like map, is there like a special term for them? Like they, they take in anonymous functions to like work? 
I think AT, I know a, a specific name for them out there. I just call them helper, helper functions, helper methods. Okay. That's me. I could be totally right. wrong. No, I'm like, just, just curious. Admitted, be, oh, yeah. Because I want to look, look more into these type of functions. I just want to know, is there like a special term so I can just look it up? Yeah. Well, honestly, you're just going to want to look at any helper functions for arrays. So helper. for helper functions. Um, yeah. I'll see if I know the specific names here. Okay. Um, I'll take a look at it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good question. Good question. You stumped me. You stumped me, Sean. I don't actually know the name stuff. Hence why. Yeah. And same here. I don't know if they have a different name, but both of them are designed to run asynchronously. So they'll hook back up when you're done to have everything back in the same order. But map and reduce are both set up specifically in a way that's optimized that you can run all of them basically at the same time instead of doing them sequentially. That's just what's going on behind the scenes. So map and reduce are kind of special. They are. Yeah, yeah. They are very special. I, I didn't get any of that, Sean, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, they, they run a little differently. Um, yeah, but good question. I will see if there's another name Thank out there. You. If anybody else knows, throw it out on the lecture questions channel or lectures chat. Love to know it. All right. Let's get into a little fun here. Who are you? What are you doing? All right. Help me out here. Wake back up. Help me answer these questions. I would use this if I wanted to escape from a loop. What keyword would I use? Break. Break. Very good, Scissors. everyone. Scissors, very exactly right. Break, awesome, awesome. Keep on going here. I would use this if I wanted to or bring throw something an back error. from a function. Bring it's something right. back. Right. Very good. Yes. Return. Awesome. As we already know, we can only return one or nothing from functions. All right. I would use this function if I wanted to alphabetize an array. Sort. 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 Oh, Array dot sort. <laughs> Array dot You don't want to use the prototype in that one. That is only for the libraries of vanilla JavaScript. But just dot sort. But I love the specificity. I can't even pronounce that today. I love it. All right, keep on going here. We can pass a task to sort an argument. Uh, sort as an argument. A task which, oh my gosh, wow, when did I write this? We can pass a task to sort as an argument. This task would be called what? So what are we passing into these parameters, parameters so we can sort something very specific? We want to sort in a specific way. What will you put inside of these parentheses? A function. A function. A function. Are you looking for anonymous functions? Specifically, we're looking for anonymous functions. So this mm -hmm. is one that we didn't explore. We saw how to map. However, I wanted to customize it, right? We put the star in front of all of our names there. But for sort, you can do the same thing. You can write an honest function to sort however way you want. So if you don't want to do alphabet, uh, alphabetize, maybe you want to do, um, instead of reverse alphabetically, instead of doing a dot reverse and a dot sort, maybe you just do it all within the sort function. Hence, you just throw in an anonymous function in there to tell it to do that. So think of those anonymous functions again is how you can customize these helper functions or helper methods to do whatever you need the application to do. So what exact, what, how, how would you write a anonymous function to use for a sort order? Would it be you return like whatever, you would return like a number corresponding to like its sort priority, and then it would sort them based on what the like return values are? So in that one, I might point you to read more online about sorts, but what you need to do is that you look at the, the two items. You, ha you have two items to compare in a sort. When you write an anonymous function for a sort, say instead of a map, we do a sort, and we have A and B. A is the left-hand side and B is the right-hand side. Also, please look this up because I always get this mixed up. It is one or the other. I'm 50-50 on all these answers here, but the A is the left-hand side, the B is the right-hand side, and you can pair. If you think A should be in front of B, you return a negative one. If you think B should be in front of an A, I believe you return one, or something along those lines. Every sort is different. I forgot it. I forgot specifically. I always have to look it up every time I need to make a custom sort. But essentially, what you're doing is saying, should I swap these two items or not? That's what this is. That's what the sort does. I won't go too much into it because sorting itself can be a whole class on its own, but that is what the sort method is doing there. 
To everyone else out there too, don't worry about it. The sort is not going to be on the test, I pinky promise. But I just wanted to answer that for you, Reed. Does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Look it up on Wikipedia. Sorting algorithms are very fun. Can very, I ask you something fun. real quick while you're yeah, still Andy, on up? that page? Yeah, um, Can you just clarify one more time how those anonymous functions know what array they're calling on? I'm so lost on that. No worries. Let's take a look at this one. How would I know from this line what array I'm calling? Take a look at the highlighted area. Oh, it nice. says cast. <laughs> All good. All good. No, no, no. It's okay. Wait, 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 wait. I literally keep having the same moment. Okay, now I understand again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no worries. No. It's recorded too if you want to relive the event over yeah. and over. It's all good. <laughs> I was awesome confused too. That's why I asked for the diagram. You know, like, thank you for asking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I understand now. Sorry. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> it's like that small detail we have to look at. And I was like, okay, who's being called and what's happening? Love it. All good. All good. So you just have to make sure that that const new cast is right after the function my function item thing. Function my function. Well, so, okay, just for clarification, so, this is not being yeah. used anywhere. This was just for an example. That is not being used anywhere in this. Well, that doesn't thing. even have to be in there. My function was never being called anywhere in here. So you can just say, Oh. I apologize. My function was never being used in this example. It was only for a side question we had. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Love that sound. Love that it. All me. right. It sounds like things are clicking. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. No, good. Any other questions, Annie? No. All right. Never again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have okay, one, one more thing? One more question. Yeah, oh, Jesse. Go ahead. No, no, go, no, go ahead. ahead. If you so with the after you do the cast.map function after that is when you when you uh declare the constant new cast so it can store the new it can store the return information inside of that variable right inside of a new brand new variable okay cool perfect now Thank if you're you. asking yourself do we have to do this absolutely not if you wanted to you oh, could always okay. just reassign cast in there if you want to do that, that means though that whatever this original information up here will be lost forever because you just re. Oh, I mean, of course, it's a console that didn't do that. It's right. let, but mm. you can do this. That's fine. But, but remember, for your original cast will be purposes. Right, right. If you want to keep the original cast around, you can. Yeah, you wouldn't want to set it to a new variable. But if you don't care if you're reassigning the array to the new one or to the old mm -hmm. one, that's completely fine. You can reuse those variables just like this. Okay. Can I ask a question now? Yeah, I'm Ellie. confused. Okay, so when you said that like you can't reassign it, I thought it was just like the array itself. That, like, like, so the items inside of the array, like even if it was constant, couldn't you change those? Or is map changing the actual array itself? Map is to creating a new array. A new, it, map is boxing it up in a new box for you and then shipping okay. it out. Got it. Okay, so it's creating a new bracket Brand set that's not the same one from before. Got it. Okay, exactly. thanks. Exactly. And absolutely, and that's not intuitive either. So these are those small little things we learn about functions as we work with them. Okay. So, so don't feel like you anybody question. out there has to know that. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay, question. good. Yeah. Yeah, we learn about so functions, and one thing we haven't really talked about, functions all have their own personality. They want things into their like parameters and they return different things and they do stu different stuff inside of them. So these are things that you get with that, just the reusing and working with code as we go down the line. It's the building blocks that we know, like this is how it works, but these functions, again, have their own personalities. So that's, yeah, the small things we take notes on. Awesome, awesome questions, everyone. Anything else on anonymous functions? I want to show you all. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jen. I, I, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you give an example where you conditionally apply a change? So, for example, if you only wanted to preface like Bill and Dan's name with the star, or like you only wanted to apply that like if the names like started with a certain letter or something. Sure, we'll go ahead and just preference. 
Bill and uh, Bill and Dan here. So oh, we have, that makes sense. There we go. And let's see. So we have that. We just go ahead and say const new cast out here. And from this, we run that. And we see on the right hand side here. Kyle knows Bill, Kyle knows Dan, but Kyle doesn't know Sigourney Weaver. And there we go. That's how we do a conditional mapping. Okay, that makes sense. Awesome. Andrew, any, I heard you also asking a question there. Do you have one that you want to? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm still trying to swallow this one. I thought the exclamation in two equals is, is if that's false. Isn't it? So or? ask yourself this. For Cookie, the first one that's going to be is Bill. Does Bill yeah. equal Sigourney? Right. Or sorry, no. is Bill not Sigourney? Right. right. Bill is not Sigourney. Oh, it's a true. So is the question is, is Bill not Sigourney? And you said, yes, Bill is not Sigourney. Therefore, true. Right. Hence, right. it will execute inside of here. That oh, right there okay. is a negation. It's called right, a negation, right, right, basically right, right. doing the opposite. But yes. The, the last item I actually had was... Um, you renamed item cookie, I think, just to prove that, like, it really means nothing what you name it. But, like, does it ever mean something? <laughs> Only to you, because you're the developer. Really? Like, there'll never be, like, some scenario with it, anything? Huh. Variable well, names if, if it did, it's just you, so couldn't, random you that... shouldn't use it. Like, there are, like, it? reserved that... names and whatnot. Correct. That is correct. But you're supposed you to use mean... an empty name space. Correct, Raiden. Yes, you technically should not use reserved words, which are the ones that light up in blue or purple. So those kind of like constant stuff. But yes, it only matters yeah. to you, Andrew, because those are arbitrarily named variables ever. And you as yeah. the developer are the only person who cares about them. The only time gotcha. that really does matter is when you're on a team. Don't be naming things cookie and pink and rainbow in a corporate <laughs> application, but that's the only small little caveat. Got it. Okay. Honestly, no, my team wouldn't even care if we did that. So actually, it's just kind of funny. So definitely do that. Sounds good. Hey, no offense to anyone who, who feels like chiming in. I mean, just generally speaking, though, but if I, I'd like to have my answers um, come from Kyle, please. Thanks. <laughs> All right, everyone. So that is finally it. Um, at the very end here, let's go ahead. Any other final questions? Going once, going twice, going three times? Um, so times? you did mention... You mentioned the, uh, you said something about anonymous functions uh, uh, ex being called immediately, but technically it's something else that the immediately executed function, right? That's, that's something else. Um, but technically you're just, you're just never writing an explicit call because the map function takes the call, right? It's not technically being done immediately. You're just, you're just not right explicit you're not writing a call yourself because you passed it to a function that calls it. Right, right. Okay, so we're talking about the, the anonymous function right here in the mapping. Uh-huh. Are you asking uh, I, I apologize, Raiden. Can you go ahead and elaborate a little bit more? Are you asking when it gets actually called inside the map? Yeah, you or it's just you had mentioned that it you had said earlier something about it being called immediately, but technically that isn't true, right? It technically isn't being true as soon as the as soon as the interpreter comes across it. It's being called. It's being executed as soon as the map the interpreter comes to the map function, and then the map function calls the past function. Right, right, exactly. So this function will only be executed and created at the same exact line. Unlike named functions, remember we go through two loops, right? We find the named functions and we remember them and then we can run them any time. Anonymous functions are not like that. Anonymous functions, we see one and we run it right then and there, and it's never remembered. So name functions will take up space, well, the anonymous functions will just be there when they're necessary. So it's, so, the, it's, it's they're not, yeah, so it's, it's being, it's being, it's basically being 
that it doesn't hit it's it's skipped by the compilation stage is the gist of it basically yeah because there's no use in remembering it right because there's nothing to remember it by because uh-huh right except when you except when you uh except when you uh assign a variable to it right correct yes and that was actually i love that that's about transition my last thing i want to show everyone let's go ahead so i want to show you one more thing about anonymous functions yes raiden absolutely right that is one way we can remember anonymous functions now i told you anonymous functions are typically forgotten about but if we want them to stick around we can do one more thing i know i see some faces out there like okay kyle what you got coming now all right remember that like i told you functions are a data type numbers are a data type strings are a data type they're data how do we remember data what do we use out of our toolkit that we Variable. talked about in the beginning of the lecture variables Variable. we can still remember anonymous functions if we truly wanted to inside of a variable so how do we exactly do that what we can do is we can say const my anon function equal to now the function I want to create. So here is what we would do. Maybe I'll just do a little extra padding on that. If replicated, and my computer will let me do that. Okay, come on, buddy. There we go, cast map. And now I'm going to say I want my anonymous my. function. I'm going to copy that and paste it into the map here. This is how we can remember our anonymous functions. So we run that, and then we're still using it. So what we just did is we remembered our anonymous function inside of a variable. Now, a common question I get, which is absolutely right in its asking is, okay, isn't this just a named function now, and you just put it to a variable causing me extra work? And I kind of answer, in a sense, you can look at it as a named function, but it's still not. Remember from what we talked about, a named function is remembered at the time of compilation, before the program is even run. We remember all of our name function always. But for this variable, remember, if we put a variable inside of like a for loop, once we're outside of the for loop, it's forgotten about. It's outside of that context. It's forgotten about. If you apply this anonymous function to this variable and you put it inside of a for loop for whatever reason, once the for loop is done and executed, it's forgotten about. That is not what a name function does. Once you create a name function, it is remembered throughout the application no matter what. There's no getting rid of it. But anonymous function, just like any kind of variable, when it's outside of its own context, if it's outside of the for loop it was used in, outside the if statement was used in, then it's forgotten about. So anonymous functions still have the possibility of being removed from memory, unlike named functions who are around the entire time the application is alive. So that's a one small thing that I really just wanted to make sure everyone truly has a headache at the very end of this class with. So that was, that was kind of what I was getting at earlier in terms of garbage collection, that basically having a named function places it in the global scope, and so it won't get garbage collected. But an anonymous function, you can, declare, you can define the scope of an anonymous function and thus give it the chance for the garbage collector to clear it once you leave that scope. Correct, yeah, we're, yes. Mo removing garbage collector from, from that, you are correct. Once, um, once it's out of its usage area, its scope, its context, anonymous functions can be removed. However, like you said, name functions are always remembered. They're in the global scope. Two things we haven't really talked about too much, but yes, you're absolutely right, Raiden. All right. This just helps the, um, this is about efficiency, maybe kind of helping uh, keep memory cleared, I guess, when you're writing code. Is, is that kind of? For one thing, yeah, if you want to do memory optimization, yeah, what we just talked about can definitely help out with that. What we should all take away from this is that make sure you're remembering where your anonymous function, if you put it in a variable, where it's used. Because remember, if you declare it in that for loop, and you try to use it outside of the for loop, what's going to happen? Reference error. Exactly. You're going to get a reference error, just like you would do with any variable. 
So to, a big takeaway from this is if you're going to do this with your anonymous functions, how we see it here on line eight, make sure you know where you're using it and where it can be used. Because anonymous functions, you have to be more careful with if you do it this way. Name functions, again, can be used anywhere inside of your application and will always be remembered. So those are the big takeaways I would want you all to have. Does that kind of help out? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. All right, I gotta pause here, everyone. We'll come back if we have any time. I got one more thing for all of us to go over. Just beyond the headache, I want you all just to be a little bit more angry at me. Let's talk about a thing called recursion. Who's watched Inception? Oh, I love come Inception. On. Thank you. I was like, don't give me that science. We all know Leonardo DiCaprio deserved that Emmy and did not get it, but whatever. Not mad about that. Actually, I learned about that whole like bad luck thing like also a few years ago, but I like to use that example. Regardless, this is an awesome movie and also makes for a fantastic example. So let's bring in a very, very simple. Why would he get an Emmy for a movie? Did it, or what did he get? I don't know, movies or awards is it an emmy or what do you get a grammy it's an oscar i was correct in the last class too i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm really like i'm losing face with everybody on here i don't know how many people are on here what do i got i'm losing face with 156 people at one time fantastic all right let's talk about this small little recursion thing keeping inception in mind let's just bring in a function here called bark so we just console log bark all right everybody okay with this one are we good? We're just gonna bark. That's all we're yeah. gonna do. Now, one thing I really want to talk about: what if we add this one small little line here? We just called a function that calls itself. This is okay. Functions can technically call each other. So, what would happen here if we called bark? Well, we take a look at it. Bark will call bark. Who will call bark? We'll call bark. We'll call bark. We'll keep calling bark over and over. This is extremely dangerous. We just had functions call each other. If we just let this thing run rampant, we'd be barking into infinity or until our computer blows up. This right here is called technically an infinite loop. However, it also demonstrates an extremely powerful thing of programming called recursion. The fact that we can call functions within functions to, re uh, to repeat code is very, very useful we can have functions run themselves to do a specific task. So what does this mean exactly? If you wanted to essentially spread the news about an upcoming picnic to a bunch of people, you would tell two friends, and then you would tell them to tell two friends. Now picture that, they're gonna tell two friends, and then they're gonna tell two friends, and then they're gonna tell two friends. But eventually you're gonna get to Someone telling you, oh, I've already heard about it, tell somebody else. So they're gonna go and tell somebody else. What this does is this just spreads the message. You're essentially running this task amongst a bunch of people and eventually your entire community will know. What we just did there is telling a task to repeat itself throughout a bunch of times until a condition is met. Until everyone in the community knows about the picnic, keep telling two people. This is a quick example of recursion, doing the same task over and over to complete a task at the very end and then stop. The one thing I really want to talk to you about, besides what we just saw with Bark, Bark would just bark forever. But the picnic example I just gave you, gave you a final ending possibility. When everyone in the community knows about the picnic, then stop telling people. In recursion, we always need to have that ending goal. So. I'm not gonna to go too much into recursion. I just wanted to briefly touch about it. We're not gonna be using it too much, but it is a tool out there. If you see that you needed to add two numbers and then add two more numbers, because you need to add three, you can use recursion with that. What recursion is, is just functions calling the same exact functions to complete a task. That is it. So again, don't wanna to go too much deep into it, but I wanna let you know this is another way we can use our tools to construct our applications and reduce amount of lines of code. 
So I'm trying to think if there's any quick, fast example. We only got a little bit of time here, though. But any questions about that? Any questions specifically about recursion? It was hard for me to find that the last, you know how the person, the last person who says, I already know this, like the base, how can we find that? Like how long should the function be going on and on until we find that final person saying, okay, stop? Yeah, so that would be a conditional. You'd ask the if statement, does person know? If person knows, aka is it true, then return or tell somebody else. So essentially you'd be asking yourself a conditional. It's like, does this end, end the conditional or end requirement met? If it is met, then you would cease the, uh, cease the function, you'd return. Hence, you'd stop the recursion there. So essentially you would loop until a condition is met, kind of like a while loop, but in this case, we're running functions within functions. Thank you. So you to, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Hannah. I know that wasn't the best example and I apologize. I'm trying to think of a better, not analogy, more of a better example to do um, recursion, but bark is one of them. I think that's something I can do quick. It's coming to me. So if I think of one, I'll do it. Maybe tonight. I think maybe tonight's studio will let me do it once, but possibly. Factorials. Any other questions? What was it, Sean? Factorials is another one. So five factorial, five oh. times four times three times two. True. True. Because it could technically do that. So we can go ahead and see a little quick factorial here. I mean, recursion methods are fun to just do real quick. Um, Sean's factorial. What was it? How many times? It's like, how many times you had to multiply by? And then um, I, I forgot, what are the two parameters in the factorial? Oh, uh, you're going to take in a number, and then it's going to multiply, uh, you know, if you send it five. And then two into three into four into five. Yeah. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. So it'll keep it'll keep calling itself, and then subtract so subtract one from itself, call itself, and keep multiplying it through. Oh my Why is this thing not registering? That's what function run. Then you see T. Oh, I did. T I one. There we go. Awesome. All right. So what we do is we say, what is it? Oh my gosh, I gotta try to think of a full example off the top of my head here. Um, if num is greater than zero, greater than zero, yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, okay. Then we would return return n into factorial num minus one minus one times yeah. num. Right? Is that correct? Yes. There we go. Yes. I need a final return now. Okay. Oh, we'll run it. Let's see what happens. All about trial and error. I'm going to console.log factorial, and we'll do factorial five. Hopefully, it doesn't blow up the machine. Let's see what we get here. Hundred and twenty. We need to oh, uh, no, I'm getting a non right now. Oh, because it's, yeah, that's right, because it's not returning a number. So, there you go, 120. 120, that's correct, yes. Perfect, all right, there's recursion for everyone for an example. So for our vectorial num, so what we're doing is that, like I said, we need to loop or keep calling ourselves until a condition is met. That condition in this case is that num has to be greater than zero. If num is greater than zero, we keep going in there and we keep decrementing by one until it is zero. And therefore we hit return one where we just return out of there without calling ourselves. And then, each function comes back with the number it's supposed to. We multiply by that num, hence it gives us that 120. Now, if you want some extra practice, because I do have to let everyone go here in a second, feel free to go through this example and see exactly how, what is the computer doing? You might need a little bit of pen and paper, but this is recursion in its most elegant form. 
So I do highly recommend just at least exploring it if you do have that time, that want, and also the brain power to get through all that fun stuff. Why we are returning wonder? Returning one, because if I return, I, mean, I have to return something, I gotta return some number, but if I return zero, we're always gonna be multiplying by zero, and I believe I'll just run into zero. Yeah, so I gotta return one. I did that because we're multiplying here. So if this ever returns zero, zero times anything is zero. So that's why I returned one. So it's just the reflection of its own number. So zero is a dangerous number to multiply by, hence why I returned one. Does that help out? Yeah, if it's it's because it's the, the multiplicative identity. If you were adding, you would use zero, which is the additive identity. Yep. So in case uh, we are adding numbers from one to ten, then also we'll return one or uh, zero. Um, in that case, we're doing addition. I believe you can do zero. So if you're doing a, so, I already just forgot the word. Um, yeah, you do. I think it's correct, right? Nine, 10, 11, 12, no, 13, 14, 15. Yep. But we're doing addition, it should be 15, right? So oh, five, sorry. nine. Correct. 11, 12, <laughs> yeah. Math's terrible. Remember, right there's, now. Four pins, there's four pins across on a bowling, so you add the five in the back row, you add your 15. Oh, I like that. That's a good one. <laughs> all right, all right, enough fun, enough fun. It's time to get into work. That is all I have for you all tonight. Thank you so much. I hope this helps out a little bit with functions. We have now done two lectures in it. So that is all I got here for tonight. Enjoy your studio. As always, remember studio review here at eight o'clock. But yeah, awesome job everyone tonight and enjoy your studio. Thanks, Thank you, We're all back here on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. Thanks guys, bye. Thank you. Thanks Kyle. Thanks, Kyle.